Uh, I'm going to present on results on uh, formalization uh, exp experiences from Southern Africa. Uh, like Louis said, uh, the work that we did was part of a wider study spearheaded by C4 on behalf of the European Commission to understand uh, the reasons for formalization and the, its impacts and costs. Uh, in Southern Africa, we focused on four case studies. Uh, one, the baobab tree, or, which I'm going to present. We also focused on amarula, which is used to make liquor. Uh, Hoodia, uh, used in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, then lastly, we also focused on the pelagonia plant, which is also used in the pharmaceutical industry. But for this presentation, I'm going to focus on, on the baobab uh, tree. And, uh, okay, just to, big, to give you some background on the baobab tree or the baobab industry, uh, over the years, a number of baobab products have become commercialized, in particular the fruits. Uh, commercialization rose, uh, came about after the European Union uh, awarded the baobab products the novel status, and uh, that opened up a very big market for the EU. And then in the States, uh, baobab products fruit products were granted what is called the generally regarded as safe uh, status. And uh, those two uh, global blocks have given baobab uh, products, uh, baobab products from baobab uh, product, the value of baobab products from Southern Africa uh, is now about a billion dollars per year. And then there's also a flourishing market for baobab crafts especially in South Africa for tourists. And because of this new market for baobab products, resource degradation has crept in and so has skewed the distribution of benefits from baobab use. Therefore, according to the state, there is need to, there was, there is need to find pathways towards attainment of conservation of natural of the baobab products and livelihood improvement for those that use the baobab tree products. That was the main reason why the government had to, the state had to come in and formalize the baobab sector. However, there has been other factors that have been driving the formalization process. One has to do with the, to deal with the black soot disease which affects the baobab tree and it is so far, indications are that the tree succumbs to this disease if it is overused, and the collection of bark predisposes this tree to the black soot disease. And then to ensure social justice, like I said earlier on, to make sure that benefits are equally distributed across board. Then it's also a source of revenue, because there is a lot of money involved. There is a, it's also, potentially it's a source of revenue for the states through a raft of taxes that I'm going to explain later on. And then uh, there was a bit of chaos in terms of how the resource was being used. So the state wanted to restore order. Uh, in terms, I'm going to give you an overview of what has taken place. There has been a raft of, uh, acts, of, of, of acts put in place, or that were in place but are now being used to regulate the baobab industry. I will draw your attention to three such key acts. The Rural District Council, for example, uh, gives the Rural District Council, which are the local level state uh, authorities, the power to collect the revenues from use of, baobab pro, from, of natural products, including the baobab tree. And then it also gives the this act gives the district councils authority to set up local level structures that will coordinate uh, management of uh, natural, pro natural resources. This is a superimposition on cultural, on traditional systems that have been in place uh, since time immemorial. Then I'll also draw your attention to the Communal Lands, the communal lands Forest Projects Act. This act is interest is the uh, 
Yeah, this one. It's, interested, it's interesting in that it, commercial, it criminalizes commercial use of, 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 of natural products. Use of natural products is confined to, to only use. Beyond that, you need uh, to get a permit. And uh, the Forest Act authorizes the Forest Commission, a government arm, to, the, to, to, to issue out permits. It's going to, I'm going to explain how the permit system works. Then maybe I also need to draw attention to the fact that while these acts are being put in place and used, there's been a lot of unfolding social and economic processes. In particular, I want to draw attention to this operation, Operation Remove Field or Operation Mrambatshina. This was an operation that was done in 2005 by the government, ostensibly, initially, to clear urban areas of illegal structures but later on it was taken to rural areas and this indeed affected the baobab industry in that we had the structures, marketing stores that were lined up along the highway for marketing baobab products and these stores were destroyed in the name of trying to formalize not only urban settlement but also the, 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 the the natural, in the, the natural resource management and use. And to, to those who were affected, the destruction of the marketing stores w went beyond that. It was also demolition of livelihoods and the future. Then uh, there was also the issue of uh, the land reform. As some of you might be aware of, we had the uh, historic, if not somewhat uh, controversial land reform from 2000 up to uh, the recent past. And uh, the mantra around the land reform was that land, was, land is the economy and the economy is land. And to people who are using the baobab trees, the land and so is everything that was on it, that is on it, had to be used anyhow in order to generate income and to improve the local economy. Anyway, I'm going to then focus on that's, that's a brief background in terms of uh, what has been done in an effort to formalize the, 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 the baobab sector. And uh, I'm now going to focus on what the impacts have been. I'll start off with social impacts. We've, uh, women have been left out of the lucrative export market for crafts. Like I said earlier on, crafts are, have a big market in South Africa. And in the past, we, both men and women used to take their crafts there. But uh, when the government came in and tried to regulate, women have now been left out, largely because uh, there is uh, a raft of uh, permit systems that have been put in place. And uh, the way it affects women is that at the border, you are required to pay a lot of money. And uh, you have to oil hands. There is a lot of corruption involved, to the extent that some of the officials at the border post reportedly asking for sexual favors from women so that they can expedite the, 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 the movement of their crafts. And the, the morality, issues, morality issues aside, in a country where until recently HIV AIDS stood at 25%, it will be full hard to have extramarital uh, affairs. Then there has been demand for accountability from district councils by local resource users. Local resource users are required to pay a number of fee of a number of levies. For example, an annual marketing fee of ten dollars. And the resource in local people are saying we can only pay if this levy the, the, okay. If what we pay is commensurate with services that we get from, from council. If council doesn't deliver, which it doesn't do it with the whole taxi. So there's been resistance from local, local people to pay to, for, for they've been, there's been demand for accountability. Then local erosion of local practices. Before government came in, local customer systems were in place to regulate use and management of the baobab tree. But uh, now the state has come in and uh, in a half way, I should say. So some practices are no, some customer practices are if just been if, 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 if stopped to regulate use of the baobab products, then later on we've, so we 
The state's approach has been one of carrying a big stick but walking softly. Sometimes it comes in heavy-handed, but at times it uh, assumes uh, it tends to soften its stance and, uh, as it says, as, they, as local officials say, to show a human face. So sometimes they say, okay, people, you can go and harvest, and, but uh, in, a, in, in a sustainable way. Then there have also been some uh, ecological uh, costs and benefits. Trees have become more debugged because of the have the, of the have taxes that people pay, they claim it gives them, it is payment of that, of the taxes and levies, gives them authority to go and debug trees, for example, as much as they want. So a number of trees are now, so debugging has gone up, removal of germplasm from the area. A lot of uh, fruit trees are collected from bulb producing areas and crushed into oil or exported to or taken to urban areas. So that's, that's, there is removal of germplasm from bulb producing areas. And then we have noted a trend in that heavily debugged trees tend to produce less fruits. Have you, you have use of complementary tree products. There are a number of complementary tree products, bikimia, acacia, that are used to dye meds or crafts from bulb, made from bulb meds and there has been an increase in the use of these, of these trees. Economic costs and benefits, lost revenues, craft makers and resource harvesters. In the past, a study that was done indicated that a household would get about $350 to $1,500 a year. But uh, now it has really gone down. And uh, the state also has lost out in the process because of resistance from potential uh, taxpayers who are not happy with the, the way this process, the formalization process has been, has, been tech, has been done. Then the complex regime taxes in the country, it's, it's quite complex. You need, if you want to harvest, because I said commercial use is criminalized through the, the Communal Lands Produce, Forest Produce Act, but should you decide to but there is a leeway uh, for one to commercially harvest. And that entails engaging the Forest Commission, which is located 130 kilometers away from in the case, in, in, in the case that I'm presenting on. It's located 130 kilometers from the community, and one has to pay an inspection fee of $20 to the Forest Commission who come and assess if it is, makes sense for you to go ahead and harvest whatever you want to harvest. Once you have harvested, you have to pay another $20, a move, which is called the movement fee, to, have, to move your product from where you have harvested it to a, a point where you want to sell it or process it. Then if you want to export the pro, some products, for example, crafts, you have to pay $10 export fee on the Zimbabwean side. And then you also have to pay $10 to the Minister of Agriculture, the Inspectorate Department, for f to get a fumigation certificate, which you'll never get anyway. Then when you get to the South African side, you have to pay an import duty of $8, $0.08 cents a met or something like that. So there's been a raft of full, of full tax regimes put in place. Then in terms of overall cost and benefits of the formalization process, Young and educated men who are able to export crafts to neighboring countries are the main beneficiaries because it's quite lucrative to export your crafts to neighboring countries. And uh, it's only young and educated men who are now able to beat the system as it were. Then corrupt, corrupt traditional leaders uh, are also benefiting through charging expedite fees. Of course, the state has come in, but traditional leaders are still uh, regulating use in, 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 in and uh, for you to be able to harvest they can also they charge you some a small fee expedite a small expedite fee then some shoddy dealers at the or towns at the bo at, 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 at border points they charge you if you want to illegally uh, cross your take your export your goods they'll charge you some fee, and it's quite a lot of money, about 200 rands, which is about $20, and depending on the value, volume, value of your goods, then the rural this council has lost, and to, to date, when I checked their receipts, they had only recovered about 20% of potential revenue that they could, they, of, of 
they, they only collected 20% of potential revenue, and this arising from the fact that look, people are resisting to pay the, the taxes and revenues. And then formalization, in, by way of conclusion, I would say formalization of the Baobab trade has had multiple unintended consequences. For example, by commission or omission, state laws are used to exploit the resources without any concern for local cultures and the resource base. And then problems of Baobab formalization seldomly fall snugly in the purview of either the state or a traditional system of, of governance. And this calls for a hybrid of both uh, uh, systems to be in place. Customary system, because uh, both systems uh, have their own weaknesses and strengths. For example, customer systems seem to be weakening due to main factors. Politics, politicization of traditional leaders were supposed to be guardians of customer systems. Uh, economic challenges, as some of you might be aware, until recently our inflation was over 500 billion percent. When you have a situation like that, they say necessity knows no law. And sometimes tr customer systems couldn't cope. Then the state, in the state is also weakened by its bad images, popular policies, uh, operation remove youth being an example or a case in point. And the state is also poorly resourced, located 130 kilometers away and with only one vehicle. It's not possible to effectively monitor and implement uh, policies in place. Thank you.